Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Undergraduate Economics Club uh, 2023 uh, debate. Um, and so I think we have a very uh, exciting topic this year, uh, which is um, our generative artificial intelligence uh, uh, pro programs good for the US economy. Uh, so this is a topic that I've been uh, wondering a lot about myself, so I'm very interested to see uh, what uh, the, the, the two teams um, are going to say. Um, I've also been wondering about this on a sort of smaller scale of is this, are these technologies like uh, chat GPT going to be good for our students or bad for our students? You know, are we gonna, uh, you know, or for our teaching, are we gonna be able to tell if an essay is written by a student or by ChatGPT, or maybe though that this will open up all kinds of opportunities for learning for students and you know and, and new things. So so it's hard to say what the effect is going to be on education or on ability to teach, and so but we're going to approach a much bigger question of what's going to be the effect um, on on the whole economy. So we've got the, the the pro team over here and the con team over here. Um, I'm very excited to see what they have to say, and Ellie will be uh, moderating the, the debate. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Itai. My name is Ellie Zyper. Yep. So welcome to the 2023 Annual Undergraduate Economics Club debate. My name is Ellie Zyper. I'm a sophomore economics and OIM major, and will be your moderator for today's debate. The session is being recorded, and the recording will be available on the Economics Department website. Today's proposition for debate is, generative artificial intelligence programs are good for the US economy. On the matters of format, the debate will go as follows. We will begin with 15 minute opening statements from each group, starting with the affirmative. Then we will have a five minute break. Next, we will get into a 16 minute argument and rebuttal section that will be broken down into four four minute segments meaning it will go from the affirmative speaking for four minutes to the negative speaking for four minutes, etc. We will then have another five minute break. We will then have a 10 minute question and answer portion from the judges. We will finish with five minute closing statements from the affirmative and the negative with the negative having the last word. On the matters of keeping time, I will be tracking the time on my phone to ensure everyone is getting the appropriate amount of time to speak their case. I will also display a five minute and a one minute warning to notify the speaker when they have five and one minute left. I will now introduce the participants and the judges. For the affirmative, we have Nicholas Quigley, Songkop Korapali, Grace Davis, and Kisan Hong. For the negative, we have Owen Morosky, Barrett Patin, Alex Gillespie, Joshua Chase, Lee Sutherland, Finn Kniff, and Olivier Bradley. Our judges this year are Itai Sher, Associate Professor and Undergraduate Program Director of Economics, T. Ponker Basu, Professor and Graduate Program Director of Economics, and Chris Booner, Assistant Professor of Economics. Thank you all for taking the time to judge the debate this afternoon. Are there any questions about the format or timing of the debate? Great, now that all of the rules and the participants have been introduced, we will be able to start the debate. Let me prepare my timer, and I will give the floor to the affirmative. You have 15 minutes for the opening statement in one second. You may now begin. Thank you, Ali, and uh, good afternoon to, to all. Our, our team thinks of generative AI as the Robin Hood of the US ec ec economy for three main reasons. Firstly, stealing away in inefficiency, uh, in inefficiency. Uh, second, em empowering workers, and third, redistributing the wealth of pro productivity to every corner of the nation. When we look at the growth of a country's ec economy, a significant factor towards that is the ec economic growth. To the in increase and improvement of, of goods and services, which brings us the quantity and, and the quality, uh, which is perfectly el elicited by two main things. First, the GDP, and secondly, the efficiency. Um, uh, for, for furthermore, Goldman, Goldman Sachs predicts that the potential impact of generative AI on the GDP in the United States by 2030 is significant. The US has already noticed the considerable impact of generative AI 
uh, on in industries such as media, entertainment, and advertising and design affecting a trillion dollar market size. Gen generative AI has the potential uh, to significantly Im improve the GDP in the United States and globally with estimates ranging from a 1.5 increase in the US labor uh, productivity growth. Furthermore, generative AI can enhance content creation in, in, uh, in, in industries like media and entertainment. Um, and these kind of al algorithms usually um, generate realistic images, videos, graphics, saving time and resources for content creators. Furthermore, this efficiency can lead to increased productivity, faster turn turnaround time, and cost savings, ultimately contributing to economic growth in these industries. So far, according to HubSpot, 75% of uh, marketers say generative AI helps them create more content than they would without it, and 77% of, of, uh, of, of marketers agree that generative AI could help create content more efficiently. Um, all, already seeing the benefits of gen generative AI currently just in increasing and improving the goods and services produced following a predicted increase in the value and output of, of goods makes generative AI crucial to boost economic growth. And with that in mind, you may have questions um, up about the result in jobs um, from generative AI. And with that, I'll pass it off to Nick. AI also has the capacity to create jobs and even new industries through technological innovation. According to the World Economic Forum, AI will create 97 million new jobs by 2025. This is a huge figure that runs counter to the narrative that AI destroys jobs and creates unemployment. PwC predicts that AI will create around 1 million jobs in the healthcare industry as AI-assisted technicians will become a new profession. Additionally, the AI maintenance workforce will skyrocket, as well as machine learning engineers, software developers, and data scientists. As you can see, the projected growth spurring from AI tracks with historical trends in long-run occupational growth. In a, in a variety of industries, especially professional and administrative work, millions of new jobs today did not exist in the 1940s. Today, the professional sector employs the most Americans out of any industry. AI is slated to have similar effects, innovating job growth in unforeseen ways. This economic growth will need to be paired with government incentives, decrease regional concentration, and training programs to provide workers with new skills. The emerging markets AI creates will push society into a new innovative landscape, providing new jobs and societal benefits. In addition to a growth in the supply of jobs, AI will have a transformative effect on the labor market by improving the lives of workers in existing sectors with minimal unemployment effects. According to estimates by Goldman Sachs researchers, 63% of jobs in the near term will be complemented by AI, 30% unaffected, and only up to 7% of jobs will be substituted. This large-scale complementary effect will make countless workers' lives easier by delegating the more tedious tasks of their jobs to AI. According to this forecast by Gartner, by 2030, 44% of AI business value will be derived from decision support and augmentation. This forecast not only shows economic growth spurred on by generative AI to the tune of $3 trillion, but also that most of that will be complementary to existing workers. Workers will be less focused on sifting through large databases or manually answering repetitive queries and more focused on the human elements of their jobs, more likely to inspire passion and productivity. For the jobs may be replaced, the researchers singled, singled out the legal industry and the administrative industry as being most likely to have jobs replaced. However, such trade-offs are often the cost of innovation. The invention of the typewriter and later the computer also put some bookkeepers and secretaries out of a job, but we accepted that trade-off in exchange for the immense complementary boost for many employed in those sectors as well as countless others in various industries. Public policy changes will also be necessary to help those left behind in the AI boom, such as integrating 21st century skills, including communication, complex analytics, and creativity into education and job training. Additionally, this retraining will cause workers to become less replaceable and more productive, which could have positive effects on employee wages. Additionally, AI will provide benefits to the consumer. Developments in gener generative AI will lower prices to consumer due to increased efficiency, 
With this increased spending power comes more contribution to the market, as well as disposable income that can be saved or spent for leisure. In addition, AI will provide better and more personalized products to individuals, including life-saving applications like medical diagnoses or more trivial ones like customized dating app advice. AI has the power to transform the lives of the common man for the better, and if implemented thoughtfully, can be the rising tide that lifts all boats. All right, so now I'll provide some insight into the specific application of generative AIs in the IT sector. Here the key term is process automation, so that includes code generation, troubleshooting, data entry, manipulation, or processing. There will be less human error, there will be less costs involved. A good example of this would be the field of data science or analysis. It's very rare the case that you have a perfect data set or after you collect the data, it's usually the case you have to clean it, you have to take care of missing values, you have to take care of uh, values that are nonsensical values, and that is where generative AIs can shine. They can help with value imputation, for example, and uh, uh, just take care of the tasks that traditionally humans, or until now humans, have had to do. Another good example of generative AI application here in, a, in the IT sector would be uh, with the company called Apian AI Skill Designer, or Apian. Uh, what they have done is they provide services to businesses for email classification or document classification. So that means, for example, um, having received customer reviews, responses, inquiries, feedback, stuff like that. They can classify it for a business in order to, or for the business to uh, make better decisions or make better solutions to increase customer satisfaction. And equal, equally with uh, document classification they can increase organizational efficiency thereby. Right. Um, then a quick example, this relates to the finance sector. Um, Liberty Mutual insurance company have collaborated with MIT in uh, implementing generative AI into their um, risk assessment methodology. And what they've done, for example, is created a computer vision or computer system um, that allows to detect that allows them to detect um, certain risk profiles of roads or um, um, risky conditions of roads to improve um, ri the risk assessment in general. I'll pass it off to Nick to uh, go deeper into the finance sector. Every year, billions of dollars are invested into financial markets all over the country. Why? Because we have confidence that our money will be safe in the hands of banks. Trust is one thing a functioning economy cannot do without. But in an age where data breaches are becoming increasingly common, trust is hard to come by. To build assurance in the market, companies are strengthening their cybersecurity networks by implementing new softwares and hiring more analysts to run them. But it is not enough. Cybersecurity breaches are much more frequent now than ever before, with a 30% increase in attacks within the past 10 years. Though data breaches uh, often occur outside and are associated with external sources such as hackers, hundreds of, pre of preventable breaches are, per are perpetrated every year internally. On the whole, cybersecurity today fails because the operating systems are too complex for employees to use and the data is just too numerous to be properly checked for threats. And even a small error caused by a person with the best intentions can spell disaster for a multi-million dollar financial firm and the millions of people whose money they are entrusted with. This is where generative AI um, this is where generative AI models have a role to play in saving the financial sector of the economy. AI has the capability to comb through a copious amount of data almost instantaneously. Uh, and thanks to machine learning, it knows exactly what to look for. This can take an arduous job that requires hours, even days, to perform by a team of employees, and it reduces it down to a simple task that takes seconds. When AI flags information it finds suspicious, it, the result is reported to an analyst or supervisor who ultimately has the final say on what to do with this information. This acts as a solution to both external and internal financial threats. SEC investigations into embezzlement also often turn up empty-handed. We have seen firsthand how often they miss key data, to the detriment of us all. Imagine if Bernie Madoff had been arrested before he defrauded investors out of tens of billions of dollars instead of after. Again, the quantity of information required to sift through in order to convict Madoff was just too large for a team of experts to successfully handle. But the inconsistencies in the company's financial records would have been easily flagged by a more advanced security network. 
The amount of time and money saved by the integration of generative AI into existing security networks um, is unparalleled by the existing, any existing forms of technology we have today. Major players are already incorporating generative AIs, um, such as JetGPT, um, companies that include Morgan Stanley and Bain & Company financial consultants. And it is clear why they are doing this. They wish to keep their clients safe and reinforce the integrity the market is so heavily reliant on. It is time to leave antiquated security procedures in the past and give financial markets the tools to combat today's challenges before they occur, instead of being left to regret the consequences of fraud and theft that could have so easily been prevented. Generative AI technologies are here to stay, and they will have transformative positive impacts on GDP, the labor market, consumers, financial institutions, and security. Let's not deny the inevitable crawl of technological process and instead embrace the opportunities generative AI will provide. Thank you. You don't wish to use any more time? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, excellent. The negative team will now have 15 minutes to present its main argument. We firmly believe that generative AI is bad for the economy for six key reasons. First, the conception and application of AI under capitalism represents the next iteration of a class war waged since the Industrial Revolution, in which the middle class wages, bargaining power, and employment are eroded for the profit of the elite upper class. Second, AI is inherently biased, replicating widespread biases at the input level, obscuring them at the transformation level, and perpetuating them at the application level. Third. AI hinders not only academic integrity in our higher ed institutions, but also the human capital development of the next generation, leaving the next future, leaving our future workforce underskilled and over-reliant on AI. Fourth, through its usage in politics and gradual replacement of search engines, AI exacerbates misinformation, obscures nuance, and discourages critical thinking necessary for informed voting and decision making. Fifth, because generative AI companies operate in all globally markets, where power is concentrated in the hands of a select few, AI decreases competition, increases prices, and generally hurts the people. Sixth, because of its generative capabilities, AI disrupts the creative industry and hurts artists, authors, and musicians whose works are now at risk of being used without their consent or at risk of being replaced entirely by AI-generated content. As we will see, AI is unequivocally harmful to the US economy. I will now pass it on to Owen, who will start us off with AI's harms to the middle and lower classes. Contention one, AI is the next iteration of the class war. The use of our capitalist system seeks to maximize profits for firms and their owners. Firms want to cut costs in any way they can and they will use AI to automate their work first and cut these costs. But these costs they're cutting, they aren't just individual costs. These happen to be people's wages, which they rely on to feed their families and, and for all other needs of life. A study by Bruegel found that as many as 54% of jobs in the EU face the probability or risk of computerization within the next 20 years, with Goldman Sachs predicting two-thirds of occupations are under the risk of being partially automated by AI. And furthermore, a McKinsey study found 30% of the share of jobs could be displaced. How are we already seeing the loss of these jobs in the middle class, especially in post-secondary white-collar jobs in, in industries such as manufacturing and assembly line work, data entry and analysis, financial services, legal services, insurance underwrites and claim representatives, agriculture and computer programs. And this is, but this is only the start as AI becomes more and more developed in our economy. These losses are being, these losses of people losing their job, they, these workers now have to go through these reskilling if they can possibly keep a job in the middle class or else they have to pick up non-skilled labor. And this is causing workers to feel alienated. However, because of this high unemployment rate that we will see from the loss of jobs, the labor force will lose their collective bargaining and individual bargaining power, and they will not be able to argue for fair benefits leading to higher job polarization. And this is only the start as AI becomes more prevalent in the workforce. This is, so we must act now to fix this issue. Our contention too is that AI is inherently fraught with bias. Our next argument focuses on the bias that is endemic to AI and cannot be eliminated. 
More specifically, we see systemic harmful biases at three levels of AI, at the input level, at the transformation level, and at the application level. A report published last year by the UN Habitat for a Better Urban Future summarizes this problem eloquently, explaining that AI systems reinforce the assumptions in their data and design. In order for an algorithm to reason, it must gain an understanding of its environment. This understanding is provided by the data. Whatever assumptions and biases are represented in the data set will be reproduced in how the algorithm reasons and what output it produces. Similarly, design choices are made all along the AI lifecycle, and each of these decisions affects the way an algorithm functions. Because negative societal assumptions may be reflected in the data set and design choices, algorithms are not immune to the discriminatory biases embedded in society. Now that we have a high-level understanding of the various biases embedded within generative AI systems, let's dive deeper into the three levels we mentioned earlier, where we see these biases manifest. First, there's bias at the input level. Timna Gabriel and her co-authors in one recent paper described that one of the shortfalls of large data sets based on text from the internet is that they overrepresent hegemonic viewpoints and encode biases that are potentially damaging to marginalized populations. Furthermore, Crawford in 2021 explains that the risk of historical bias occurs when there is a limited understanding of the historical, sociocultural, and economic biases within data sets and the context in which they were made. Data collection is more than a purely technical process as it is shaped by human choices that are context dependent and difficult to trace later. Suresh and Gutag in 2021 reasoned that by removing the data from its context of collection can therefore lead to harm, even when the data set still reflects the world accurately. Where still, since AI systems require a large amount of data to learn, discarding historical data is not always feasible, and collecting more data to compensate still does not mitigate the risks of unfair outcomes, since historical discrimination still persists in the results. Second, there is bias at the transformation level in the algorithm, which is what happens between the input and the output. This bias is the hardest to observe and the one we are least qualified to analyze, but the main idea is that the lack of visibility and understanding of what happens in this opaque process gives an air of objective scientific authority to an input that is in fact deeply biased. Third, there is bias at the application level, which is the most important and where we can examine the real life consequences. For instance, according to a report published last year by the UN Habitat for a Better Future, many law enforcement agencies around the world have turned to AI as a tool for detecting and prosecuting crimes. AI applications for policing include both predictive policing tools, as in the use of AI to identify potential criminal activities, and facial recognition technology. All these technologies have been shown to be biased in multiple ways and lead to harsher impacts on vulnerable communities. For example, the COMPASS algorithm used to predict the likely recidivism rate of a defendant was twice as likely to classify black defendants as being at a higher risk of using the past of, of recidivism than they were while predicting white defendants to be less risky than they were. By using the past to predict the future, predictive policing tools reproduce discriminatory patterns and often result in negative feedback loops, leading the police to focus on the same neighborhoods repeatedly and therefore leading to more arrests in those neighborhoods. Another example is when the Chicago Police Department used a sim similar algorithm to create a heat list, using it as a suspect list and surveillance tool, causing the people on it to be therefore more likely to be arrested and detained. Similarly, facial recognition technology shows that poor accuracy for certain demographics has been widely adopted by law, law enforcement agencies, resulting in wrongful arrests and pro prosecutions. AI systems tend to perpetuate and accentuate existing biases under the guise of mathematical neutrality. Such systems are all the more dangerous when used for detecting and preventing crime, as law enforcement agencies often have a history of discrimination and prosecution of vulnerable communities. For these reasons and many more, even with the proper transparency and governance practices in place, AI systems should never be used to make decisions impacting human lives and human rights in such a sensitive context whatever that is in healthcare, policing, surveillance, or another area. I'll now pass it on to Lee. I have contention three, AI is bad for academic integrity and human capital development. A rise of online learning during COVID and caused more students to turn to AI and other methods of cheating on assessments and homework. This caused academic integrity to be questioned because the work is not a representation of what the student knows. Teachers will not be able to discern students' work and AI unless the work is online and AI detecting software is installed. And even if the teacher does get AI detention, detection software, students can go around it using more AI. The use of AI on assignments can cause grading systems to not hold as much value as some of the students are only using AI. This compromises the weight that the degree or work holds since the quality of education has decreased, as well as causing more competition between students who use AI on their assignments and those who do not. An AI extension that is being used is Grammarly, which scans documents and gives back feedback, 
feedback on grammar, clarity, and other linguistic components. This can cause students who, uh, to be less aware of grammatical errors because they have an AI tool that will just tell them what's wrong, rather than students acknowledging it themselves. The use of AI can also decrease human capital based on a study done by the OECD, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In 22, they measured capital, human capital using the PISA survey, which me measures the quality of education, and the mean years of schooling, which measures the quantity of education, giving a direct estimate between the two components. The paper written by the OECD finds that the elasticity of the stock of human capital re with respect to the quality of education is three to four times larger than for the quantity of education. This study contrasts with previous data in the past years, since now they have found the quantity of education has less of an impact on human, comp human capital compared to the quality. The quality of education will decrease due to an increase of AI sites being used by students. They use AI as a crutch and they will not be able to, uh, be able to go without it, and this lowers critical thinking skills. All of this will cause a decrease in human capital in the future. Good, so my contention is that AI is bad for democracy and informed politics. AI will have a negative impact on the future of democracy. The increase in society's reliance on AI will greatly exacerbate the amount of disinformation in our digital world. Given AI's ability to create cohesive arguments in seconds, conspiracy theories and propaganda are now able to be created and shared much more effectively than before. With this technology, not only will disinformation become more prominent, but it will influence the proficiency of these false narratives. We have already seen examples of this. In 2019, the company OpenAI responsible for creating ChatGPT, developed an early model for the AI bot that we have today. They found that this chatbot was so effective in producing fake news that they ultimately decided not to release it. Although choosing to withhold this technology from the public, the ability to produce misinformation is still present in these more recent models. This is not the only example of false narratives being spread. Recently, the Republican National Committee released a campaign against current President Joe Biden using an entirely AI-generated content. The campaign which, can, which attacked the current president included entirely fake voices and graphics, showing not only how easy it is to produce this propaganda, but also how convincing it is to the public. This extensive library of problematic content will likely be used to worsen the already strong political divide within the United States, or worse, be used to draw more people towards extremist texts or groups. Another issue that this highlights is how AI bots respond to prompts. Single, direct answers obscure nuance and disagreement amplifying consensus while drowning out less heard voices. This isn't new, but it's an exacerbation of an existing trend. Google already uses natural learning processes, natural language processing, and query interpretation. More importantly, they've been gradually rolling out featured snippets, which provide direct answers to your Google questions. Language models are the next step in this concerning direction. The absence of context, combined with the growing proportion of disinformation spread online, will surely lead towards the inability of future generations to think critically as the general public becomes more desensitized to misinformation. I will be presenting contention five, that AI exacerbates oligopolies. Chat models operate in a field that can only exist with oligopoly markets where just a few firms can produce the ingredients necessary for the creation of these large-scale AI models. Before building a model, you need to be highly skilled and knowledgeable, typically with a master's or doctoral degree. Then, in order to teach the best AI models, you need trillions of data points, and as we saw in recent antitrust litigation, big tech has a monopoly on this data, and they have proven that they will capitalize on this monopoly through restricting access to data and selling it at a premium. Finally, the hardware used to teach models is pricey. As one of only two big players in the computing platform market, Microsoft notes that in development of ChatGPT, they needed to create huge supercomputers made of thousands of expensive GPUs. Throughout the whole development process, you need to pay computer engineers, implement cooling systems, backup generators, and other forms of infrastructure. The cash cost of this infrastructure is immense, and only the biggest tech companies can make this investment. Big Tech realizes this and seeks to profit, and the current CEO of Amazon, Andy Jassy, has even said that there will be a small number of companies that can invest that time and money, and we will be one of them at Amazon. These barriers will lead to AI markets that operate with only a few large players. We have seen the effect of the, 
We have seen the effects of these business practices on inequality before, with the likes of Standard Oil, IBM, Amazon, and Microsoft, through high prices and exploited workers. And I will now pass on to my friend Alex. The rise of generative artificial intelligence has the potential, to disrupt, the potential to disrupt the way jobs and creative industries have been done and poses a threat to job security of those currently in the industry. Artists fear losing their jobs to AI systems like DALI and DALI2 who can create artwork in under a minute. Artwork that, artwork that would have taken artists from a few hours or days on a small piece of artwork to weeks or months on larger, more complex projects. For this reason, artists are losing work because AI decreases demand for them and will only continue to do so as the AI systems improve. As for writers, AI models such as ChatGPT, AI Writer, and many more have been used to write articles, scripts, and even books. Not to mention, these AI systems generate their work from combining, uh, combining work from all over the internet without giving credit to the original creators. These companies are essentially stealing other people's work to create profits for themselves. We are already starting to see pushback from the Writers Guild of America who have failed to negotiate higher wages for six weeks. When on strike May 2nd, 2023, with their main concerns being generative AI replacing them as well as decreasing wages. According to a recent Writer Guild of America report, median weekly writer-producer pay has declined 23% over the last decade when adjusting for inflation. This is the only the beginning of disruptions in the creative industry, with 26% of jobs in the arts, design, entertainment, sports, and media industry being exposed to, auto being exposed to automation according to Goldman Sachs. That's the end. Both teams will now have five minutes to collect their thoughts and arguments for rebuttal. Sweet. Um, Owen, one, one point which you mentioned was that 54% of jobs are due to risk because of a AI development. How, however, a World Economic Forum report said that and it, pre uh, uh, and it predicted that the number of jobs uh, destroyed will be surpassed by the number of jobs created tomorrow. Jobs that, uh, such as an AI prom in, uh, in engineer and, and more of uh, more others. For example, AI, uh, including uh, gen generative AI, have de destroyed 85 million jobs, but will create 95 million new roles, which are more un uh, adapted to, to the new division of labor uh, between humans, machines, and al algorithms. So what does this truly mean for the US economy? This means if, uh, a one, one of three things. One, it will in increase efficiency, leading to more quantity of the goods and uh, services. Secondly, it will leave ample time for more complex and, and, and creative work to improve the quality of jobs. La lastly, this whole Im improvement will progress the U.S. economy and better standards standards of living and eventually uh, better economic development. All right. So the opposing side also argued that certain biases or there exist biases with respect to AI and uh, AI perpetuates these biases. And we argue that it's, it's not AI that is intrinsically biased, but it's the surrounding conditions around AI. So culture, therefore. Um, really, AI is a new field. It's only come in the last couple of years, and we understand relatively little. It's really the starting difficulties, we'd say, that, that AI is having right now. And it is really impossible to make a final judgment, given that it's only been a, that it's such a new field. So therefore, AI is not actually in like intrinsically biased, but it's really uh, the people or the culture surrounding it. That's what we say. I would like next to talk about academic integrity. So honestly, students have been finding ways to um, you know, breach academic integrity to cheat on assignments for, for years now, for decades, even before AI ever existed. And maybe AI does in some aspects make this easier, but it is not AI itself that is the cause of academic integrity. Um, there's just too much access to it, essentially. Um, and it's making it a lot easier for students to uh, maybe commit academic integrity, but the technology itself is not making any sort of new strategies where this is being committed. And there are also a lot of detection methods um, that are also AI. Um, Turnitin.com, for one, is a AI detection method that can detect if students are committing academic integrity. There's, um, and then also to mention the point on democracy. So 
you mentioned how uh, OpenAI chose not to release a, um, an AI program that they deemed too, efficient, uh, too inefficient or too inaccurate to release. And this shows that, yes, maybe the technology is not quite yet perfect. However, they did not release it because they knew that there were uh, improvements to make on it. And that to me is not indicative of a threat to democracy, but rather um, you know, companies taking responsibility and um, acknowledging their mistakes when it comes to the imperfections in developing new technologies. AI could be used in shoddy ways that seek to fully replace jobs without providing much of a productivity wage to boost to workers. However, thoughtful implementation could combat this and lead to improvements for the average worker and consumers. Um, AI is predicted to be used in a number of complementary ways, such as providing accurate diagnoses in the healthcare industry. <laughs> the negative team will now have four minutes to lay out their counter argument. Okay, so one of the points that the other side made is they uh, talked about this 2020 World Economic Forum report multiple times, showing how there will be roughly a 90, just over 90 million bump in jobs, with just under 90 million jobs will be disrupted by AI. But they also failed to mention that that report also says um, that in contrast to previous years, job creation is now slowing while job destruction is accelerating. They also failed to mention how some of or some 43% of businesses surveyed indicate they're set to reduce their workforce due to technology integration. And they also talk about how these new jobs that are coming in will be more suited for the new division of labor in our economy. This new division of labor in our economy is more unequal than at any other time. The idea that AI will also increase productivity is hard to argue against. But um, it's also hard to argue against the idea that benefits of AI will be unevenly distributed. We are seeing this trend in many industries where a majority of the benefits are flowing to a small number of individuals and companies, those that own the means of production and know how to use AI efficiently. Um, and they talked about the IT industries earlier, and the tech industry is a great example of where there is this division. Um, so we can point to the, a report from, the, from Barron's in 2021 where the top five tech companies together accounted for 23% of the S&P 500's uh, total market capitalization. Even if, even if top line GDP, GDP figures increase, that is only one measure of the economy. We will likely see an acceleration in the hollowing out of the middle class. A 2019 report from the Brookings Institution found that jobs with higher wage requirements are less likely to be automated than lower. This could lead to a workforce that is made up of highly skilled, highly paid jobs and on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of low skilled, labor intensive jobs. Many of those individuals who make up the consumer spending and tax base, the middle class of this country, are going to be pushed out of their current roles due to AI. The managing director of the World Economic Forum, the source that they cited many times, also said that accelerating automation and the fallout from the COVID-19 recession has deepened existing inequalities across our labor markets and has reversed gains in employment made since the global financial crisis in 2007-2008. And all this isn't abstract. We're already seeing layoffs. Uh, due to AI implementation. In February, Sports Illustrated laid off many of their journalists after announcing that they had begun to use generative AI to help write their articles. So three quick responses. One, a high level, and then second, response to their response to our second contention, which is bias, and then third, a response to their response to our third contention, which is academic integrity and cheating. So first at a high level, we got to be mindful that all these sources are coming from companies, corporations who stand to profit from framing AI as inevitable and as good for the worker. Second, moving on to their response to our bias argument, they try to tell us that it's not AI that's the problem, but rather the surrounding environment. We agree and disagree with that. We agree that there are biases in the surrounding environment, and in the current um, applications of AI, there, there, we can't mitigate those biases. So AI in the current status quo will always have those biases. Finally, for academic integrity, they try to say that students are always going to cheat and that it's access um, to the AI that's the problem and that Turnitin can prevent this. We, again, as Lee argued, Turnitin cannot detect um, AI generated things and you can literally just prompt the AI and say, okay, now add some mistakes to this paper, make it sound like a student wrote it and they can get around it. So it's hard to regulate. And additionally, with seeing job creation, as the other group pointed out, these jobs that are being created are very high level jobs that you need masters, PhDs for. It's not very easy jobs as someone who loses their job from AI and has a bachelor's degree. This requires more advanced reskilling that the average person isn't really going to be able to get these jobs leading to more decreases in the middle class. 
As the, as, the, as the opposition stated, AI could be used in a more destructive way that seeks to fully replace jobs without providing much of a productivity wage boost to workers. However, thoughtful implementation could combat this and lead to improvements for the average worker and the consumer. According to the MIT Technology Review, AI is projected to be used in a number of complementary ways, such as providing accurate diagnoses in the healthcare industry or generating individualized lesson plans in education. These innovations would not only increase the productivity of workers by allowing them to focus on less tedious tasks, but will also increase the consumer's utility as they are now receiving higher quality and more personalized products. Based on the Goldman Sachs projections that I would note that the opposition used and declined to no notice that this partial automation is not replacement. Partial automation is a complementary effect on existing labor and will not cause people to be replaced. Um, this is the way the generative AI is projected to be most used. Deriding AI as fuel for inequality by pointing out the potential waste stratification ignores not only that larger effect that AI could create, but disregards the other side of the common man, the consumer. AI has many applications, healthcare, finance, infotech, sales marketing, and it has the potential to add um, efficiency to any of these industries. Um, However, um, regional concentration is definitely a prevalent problem, but um, this is not unique to AI, again, and it will require a concerted effort to combat, including um, investment into uh, AI innovation and talent and establishing national AI research infrastructure and initiatives to move STEM education across the country. Um, these things can all help uh, combat the intense stratification that some of these tech advancements are likely to um, bring up. The other point was you mentioned that uh, generative AI actually makes it in, uh, unequal, and I'm here to say that it's not necessarily the case. In the case that um, you play gen uh, generative AI within these uh, services, these kind of new technologies like virtual assistants and, and chatbot provide low cost free access services. Which, uh, which kind of level the playing field and, 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 and also make it more um, easy to access in, in that case. Um, additionally, you also get a, a, a lot more free information um, asymmetry where a lot more information is available to the public in all cases, which makes it more equal for the rest of the po population. Uh, secondly, there's uh, there's also and uh, they also allow small businesses to compete with large businesses in 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 the case that there's more information uh, uh, symmetry and also um, it it kind of provides more op opportunities to those who are um, em employed and unemployed as well. Um, yeah, I would also like to address several of the other points made about. Um, exacerbating uh, oligopolies um, uh, and in turn uh, AR. So I'll just I'll do this quickly. Um, so uh, the creation of oligopolies by AI isn't necessarily like an accurate statement. Um, so everyone can use AI. It's an open access resource. Um, and honestly, like when you talk about you know it's a very restricted market. No one can you know generate. It is true that a very selective amount of um, like educated people can create the AI, but you have people who have to implement the softwares, you have people who have to install, have to check the systems, and this is actually a, a, a creation of a lot of jobs. Um, and then I will move to your point about art. Um, the intrinsic value of artwork still remains even with AI generated art. Like there is many ways to tell the difference um, between uh, 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 AI art and... Uh, Thank you. The negative will have their last four minutes of the 60 minute section. All right, you may now begin. So we want to uh, look at the point that they made that this empowers workers. Um, and we want to bring up again that uh, even partial automation undermines worker necessity. Uh, and this is going to be aimed at the middle class. We're going to be looking at, at mass amounts of workers being told that a computer can do your job better than you. Um, you aren't as necessary, that you aren't as useful. Not only does this have 
economic effects like we've discussed, but there's a mass alienation, uh, a mass societal effect, uh, mass hysteria, could be mass depression, mass drug use. Uh, none of these things are conducive to any sort of economic growth. And I think we can all agree that these are all not great things to look at. So just to build off of that and sort of remember back to Owen's point about the middle class, um, we're already seeing like jobs be lost by this. We just like a few weeks ago, BuzzFeed laid off their whole blog post team and replaced it with ChatGPT. So not only are we seeing jobs actually explicitly being lost, but if, if as they argue, some of the tasks that workers um, are tasked with doing are replaced with AI, well, why would the company pay them the same? If you're doing less work, if you're less, if you're less necessary, you'll get paid less. That's the way that the incentives would encourage companies to act. Also, they try to talk about this idea of thoughtful implementation, which is again this idea that sort of big tech and the people who have interest in AI try to propagate. The idea that AI can be safe, AI can be ethical, AI can be good if we just are careful about it and we do it in the right way. Um, and that's just fundamentally untrue. If you look at AI can only exist in the context in which we're living right now, which is a context that is systemically biased, um, a context that um, where the incentives of like big tech are not aligned with the incentives of the middle class and lower class. Um, and so for that reason, AI will be harmful. Another point they made at the, in their intro statement is they talked about how AI is just like any other new form of technology to increase efficiency. And one of the ones they brought up was the, or one of the examples they brought up was the internet or computers, the internet. And I'm here to tell you it's very different than that. The internet, yes, it took away jobs in certain industries. Um, yes, exasperated inequality, but those are the only things these two have in common. The internet increased um, communication. It allowed small businesses to reach out and small businesses to be able to grow and reach new consumers and just created a huge new industry or created huge new industries and it was a new form of communication. Uh, my adversary, Nick, brought up um, that these uh, that these oligopolies may not uh, uh, materialize because uh, in applications you you have a wide number of people who can apply uh, chat models. To to that we say that um, chat models have to be created, uh, and uh, as Chat GBT has been, uh, and the infrastructure to create those chat models uh, is is controlled by only a few hands, uh, namely Amazon Web Services. Uh, Microsoft's Azure, if that's how you pronounce it, um, and it's almost impossible for new players to get in here. Uh, that's uh, almost the definition of an oligopoly, a duopoly. The judges will now have two minutes to organize their questions. So. Uh, you, you raised, both teams raised very interesting points. Uh, I would like to ask one question which both teams should respond to, and that's uh, the question or the issue about job loss. So the pro team uh, made the good point, drawing on very good research by economic historians, labor economists, that if you look at a long stretch of history, there has always been disruptive technologies. In the short run, they do create unemployment, but if you take a long run perspective, it does not. So uh, their contention was that AI is a technology just like that. There is nothing new about that. The con team made the point that there is going to be job loss. So the question to the pro team is, can you establish that this is just a technological improvement like what we have seen? And can the con team make the case that this technology is really different and we cannot draw on past historical evidence to claim that this will not increase unemployment even in the long run? Throughout history, there have been many cases where a piece of technology has come out of the box and we believed that it was going to cause an end to the labor market as we knew it. Um, Many automation examples in the Industrial Revolution, innovations in agriculture, innovations in manufacturing, and of course the internet being the last thing in this string of uh, technological advancements that has permanently, oh, <laughs> that has permanently shifted, 
Are we, is it on or no? Sorry. Okay. Here you go. That has permanently shifted the labor market as we know it. Um, like many technological advances before it, AI is being met with resistance, but it will become an integral part of the economy in many beneficial ways, as we have seen with countless technological advancements before it. Um, they try to draw comparisons from the internet, or rather contrasts, um, by saying, by, by um, stating things such as um, the internet caused increase in communication, the, increase co the internet caused um, all these different innovations that would allow small businesses to be able to um, create the complement of the labor market. And I would argue that AI um, also can do all of these same things, um, as well as the internet, if not better. Um, we're just gonna wait and see how it shapes up, but I think that it won't be any different from technologies in the long run. Uh, hi, this was an awesome question, um, and we thought about it very much ourselves. Uh, uh, framing AI in general as uh, simply another technological advancement we feel would be wrong. Um, this is a momentous shift in, uh, in, in how we go about on our day-to-day -day lives. Um, the very idea of employment is going to, to, to be turned on over its head. Uh, because we're looking at a technology that can affect every single worker. Um, even jobs that we previously thought were untouchable, uh, high level, highly skilled jobs, accountants, financial managers, computer programmers, AI can do that better than they can. Furthermore, we're seeing high, high levels of investments from this in the billions and billions and billions of dollars. Regardless of whether this technology has the ability to do so or not, society at large, financial institutions, seem to be hell-bent on making this a reality of replacing worker jobs, no matter if, if, if the technology is ready to do that or not. Yes, judges, please, thank you. We have yes, we have more time, and I can bring you the microphone. Actually, if this one, this one is working, so. Okay, so, hi everybody. Uh, so we kind of wanted to talk a little more about the aspects of like regulating AI and how to control it. So we talked about some of the potential consequences. This group highlighted a lot. This group acknowledged some of these potential consequences too and talked about how well there are ways to deal with some of these potential consequences. consequences. And so I want, was, we were maybe hoping that both groups could talk a little more about, well, uh, so the against group might argue that like, um, the sorts of regulations or the sorts of policies we could do uh, aren't gonna work or we're not gonna be able to do them. And, and to the group here, like, um, so if we think about some of the risks here related to like cybersecurity or related to job displacement um, or related to maybe regulating the bias effects or something like this, you argued that, well, you know, we could have income support policies or labor market adjustment policies, or we could put the regulations in place, the question, it posed to both groups was, uh, is this going to benefit the economy? So we have to kind of ask the question, of, is the political system up to the task? And so maybe the four group can convince us that it is, that this stuff will happen so that it'll be in a good way. And maybe the against group could talk about, well, listen, there are things we can do to control. You talk about cops or using stuff. Before AI, were cops biased? Did cops do bad things before AI? Like, what, what is it about AI that's going to make it different and why regulation wouldn't be able to deal with some of this bad stuff? Yeah, and I just want to add one more uh, thing into the mix as well. One thing that people have talked about a lot, which didn't come up so much, or at least I hope I didn't miss it in the debate, is the issue of controllability. So there's sort of the issue that, you know, you have these AI systems, we try to give them, you know, certain goals, but we don't know how to write the goals in exactly the right way. And so their goals are sort of not aligned maybe in subtle ways or in important ways with what human beings um, actually want them to do. And then they could actually do something very bad because they would disregard something that human beings really care about a lot and, and, and harm human beings. So 
Uh, maybe something about, you know, that's closely related to regulation, uh, controllability as well, what you, what you think about that. I'll give one minute for the participants to prepare. All right, so our key point here is that good regulation will have to fundamentally be based on good, a good understanding of AI itself. And that can only be achieved through investigation of AI, so more research and development. And that cannot be achieved through complete suppression. Complete suppression, I think, has never led to good things, or scientific suppression has never led to good things here. If we believe that AI is going to fundamentally reshape our world in the same way that the internet before it has, then we're going to see it being almost like effortlessly implemented into the way that we think about all aspects of life, government, education, job training, and um, it will be interwoven into the fabric of society at large. You've already seen the ways that people are now being trained um, in computer work, in tasks, in, in, in jobs that that wasn't even thought that it would be a, th a thought in their mind that they would need any kind of technological competence to perform. You'll see the same thing happening with AI in the future with a concerted effort through government and through um, private organizations and individuals as well. Um, this reshaping will be a lot um, less of a, a, a large step than some people may be anticipating because of the way that AI is going to weave itself into our lives and the way it's going to have a complementary effect on um, not just the high-level tech uh, empl employees, but also um, on low-level workers and laborers in every aspect of life. The internet, it seemed to be highly similar to generative a a AI, just with the de difference that internet has has been um, uh, almost entirely developed compared to generative a AI when still it's in it's, in its early de development stages. And this difference proves that internet has proved to be highly effective in terms of pro progressing the economy after efficient regulation and and once generative ai reaches that development of progression in terms of thank regularity you. thank you the negative will have two minutes okay so before i start i want to be clear that this resolution is not can ai be regulated but will it be regulated in the status quo um and so i think that for two reasons it won't First, because there's a past president, the past precedent of it, like AI, open AI, taking advantage of deregulation and the lack of regulation and general understanding in this area. And second, because I don't think interests are aligned in a way that will be um, like conducive to regulation. So first, regarding past precedent, we see that the way that open AI and other um, companies have sort of acquired this data necessary for these large language models was scraped from the internet with no regard for contextual integrity or people's intellectual property, things like this, things that, um, which represents them taking advantage of a lack of regulation in that area. Second, regarding future interests, um, if we think about the money that is to be made in this, there's no reason that OpenAI and these companies would want there to be regulation, so they will lobby against them. Um, and I really don't think we will see any um, regulation in this area. Um, and, yeah, we. Uh, further, uh, even according to regulation and, and, and the idea of attempting to pass certain legislation, uh, we see even with the internet, like our adversaries have brought up, uh, AI is different because we have companies that are creating models. And uh, these models are, are easily swayed. In, in changes in algorithms and changes of input data. Uh, they're malleable. And they're malleable according uh, to whatever a leading party would like to see. Um, in a day where these models can have such a heavy influence on everyone's thinking, as we've seen, uh, people tend to trust what ChatGPT might tell them. Thank you. That'll be difficult. <laughs> Would the judges like to come ask their final question? Okay, let me ask the final question, which kind of goes back to the main question that is being debated. So the, the debate was whether AI is good for the economy. And one thing that was talked about, the pro team mentioned that it will increase efficiency and growth. 
the con team mentioned many things which might lead to negative impacts on growth. So two things that immediately come to mind, human capital. So if human capital is going to be destroyed or not developed, that will have a long term impact on growth. If democracy is undermined, that will also have a negative impact on growth. So the, the, the pro team needs to counter those arguments, which the, the con team did not develop, but I would like to give them opportunity to develop the economic implications of the points you made and the, and the pro team to kind of argue against that, that you have said that it will have a positive impact on growth and you argued about uh, savings in labor, but there are other things which they pointed out. Human capital will be degraded, democracy will be undermined, that has negative impact. So which of these are stronger? And can you make a case that yes, the positive impact overshadows the negative one? And for you the opposite. Each team will have one minute to prepare. You'll have two minutes yeah. to respond. Yeah. You may begin. In terms of human capital, AI may decrease that in certain areas, but thoughtful implementation can help um, quit exacerbating these effects. Um, it can be looked at as um, a boon that will um, exacerbate academic integrity and prevent people from building the skills that they need to build. However, people argue the same thing about the internet. Again, kids are going to be looking on the computer. They won't learn how to read a good book. They won't know any of these things. But instead, you'll learn that um, new skills are going to be developed, 21st century skills, skills in analytics, skills in creativity, skills in building things that AI cannot do. I think that this presents an incredible opportunity to develop new forms of human capital that don't involve sifting through files on your computer and making sure that you know exactly where to go in the library to find the information you need and to use technology to our advantage and to use our human brains for things that technology will never be able to replace. I'd like to address the point on democracy very quick. So democracy is and has always built, been built on access to information and AI can increase access to this information. The opposition pointed out that a lot of this information has the potential to be misleading or completely inaccurate. However, there are, there are numerous sources on the internet, countless sources, that we know not to be trusted. Um, just as it is with the internet, as AI develops, we will be able to uh, better sift through these inaccurate sources, these um, incorrect sources, look for inconsistencies, um, but it is not about um, shutting out AI completely. It is about knowing what information to look at to improve your educational capacity um, and to be a more informed voter. Um, yeah, and if you have something. Else. Oh yeah, just a last note about democracy or our political system and AI. We say that AI is not the cause of social stratification, but it is simply a catalyst. The cause of it may be our political system. That is not the topic here, but all that AI is doing is accelerating that process. It's not the cause. The cause. The negative will speak for two minutes. GDP, looking at it as a reasonable example, what does it really measure? It just measures how much money we really have, how wealthy our nation really is. But when you really think about it, what does that actually mean? If half of the population can't find work or needs so much higher education to get these new access to jobs, it doesn't really mean anything. It just goes to the top, especially with these big corporations that have high barriers to enter to access AI and all this increased productivity and all these benefits that you'll see. They're not really, it doesn't mean anything because at the end of the day, the economy is based around the individual rather than just a number or statistic. So it really invalidates the point. And then additionally, with these losses of human capital that AI will have, it really, and also the instability, it will really hurt this growth in the end run just for the names of, just for the names of efficiency and productivity. Thank you judges and thank you to participants for answering. We will now have three minutes of closing statements from each group, beginning with the affirmative. You may come up and present your closing statement. So to conclude, AI will grow GDP and efficiency across the board and create new and emerging markets that will generate new employment opportunities. Existing workers will also be benefited through the complementary effect AI provides and the opportunity it presents to train workers on modern skills. 
The consumer will also be benefited as AI provides more accurate and personalized products that better meet their needs. It could even drive down prices as automation increases productivity and lowers the cost of production. Lastly, generative AI is fundamental in securing financial integrity, uh, building confidence in the market. All of these items have the power to transform the economy as we know it, in much the same way technology always has. Like it or not, AI is an unstoppable force that will sweep the US off its feet if we are not ready for it. Instead of trying to outrun the impermeable tsunami of innovation, it is time for us to do what we always have done. That is to adapt to the changes to technology and prove what is possible when human ingenuity is put to the test. Thank you. The negative will now have three minutes for their closing statement. Uh, I hope as we've, we've shown everyone today, we are far from frivolous luddites who are angry about advances in technology. And as we have shown, AI is far from a simple tool that increases productivity. It represents a momentous shift in technology where current worker conditions, low bargaining power, and exploitation will be made worse with profit going to a small number of capitalists who own the means of production. AI can only exist in the current world, and that is a world where a few interests, such as Microsoft or Amazon, are able to disproportionately influence our political economy through, the seizure and the mean, through their seizure and means of data production. We will see a world where our very democracy will be undermined, and where, and where our empathetic creative industries will be replaced by emotionless and mindless computers. In our current profit-driven system, as scholar Dan McQuillian explains, the more plausible ChatGBT Chat becomes, the more it re recapitulates the rationalizations of race science and, dat and gender constructs. Despite the claim that large language models are self-training, real-world systems require precaritized ghost work behind the scenes to keep the lights on. AI is not something out of sci-fi but instead a technological amplification of existing labor and power relations. OpenAI paying Kenyan workers $2 an hour to tag obscene material for removal is figurative of the invisible exploited labor that holds up our current existing systems of business and government. The affirmative have tried to tell us that AI has the potential for increased productivity and economic growth in the long term but we are already seeing the ne negative effects of AI on our institutions. AI will produce wealth and growth, but only for the upper class. We see AI in surveillance and policing and replacing jobs and decreasing wages. With continued unfettered development of AI technologies, we will continue to see the moral and economic decline of our society. For that reason, we urge you to vote in the negative. Thank you. Our judges will now deliberate and return with their decision. Okay, so um, we thought that this was uh, an, an excellent uh, debate on a very uh, interesting topic. Both sides were very creative and, and brought uh, strong arguments. Um, at the end of the day, we ourselves, obviously, we don't really know who's right. I mean, it's a very difficult um, uh, debate, and, and we thought it was very close. It was not at all obvious to us who won the debate. But after deliberation, um, we thought that the pro team made a little bit of a stronger argument for their side. So uh, we're going to award the debate uh, for the pro team. But it was an excellent debate all around.